It's time for the Tigers to shine as they take the stage today for SEC Media Days. In the world full of podcasts, he's the undisputed heavyweight champion of hot takes, an Auburn sports homer, master of the book, and message board legend. Get your buttons buttoned and your hats flattened because the Top Button Podcast is about to kick off. And you don't want to miss your courtside seat. Now, here's your host, Charlie Five. Yes, sir. We're back. It's another episode of the Top Button Podcast, and I'm your host, Charlie Five. Happy Thursday, and better yet, happy Auburn Day Media Day. (laughs) Happy Auburn Day for SEC Media Days. Uh, We finally, the anticipation has been building. We finally get to see our guys go up on stage and answer uh, what will probably be some interesting questions. Hopefully, we'll glean some some info, some interesting answers as well. Uh, Looking forward to it. We're going to break a little bit of that down here in just a minute. But before we do, uh, we got to give a shout out to our boy, Ford Stokes. You want to talk about getting all the answers, getting the right information? Uh, Forge your guy. He could be in, he could be at SEC Media Days every day uh, because he's got all the answers. Check him out at retirementresults.com forward slash plan. Uh, and he can give you that free portfolio analysis that will include a ton of different things to make sure that you're uh, you're moving in the right direction, that things are going they're going in the way they need to go for you to get where you need to be uh, Ford's the guy for you. I know he's going to be on pins and needles watching today, uh, gleaning any information he can, uh, and he'll be excited uh, along with you to watch the Auburn Tigers take the stage. Big Auburn guy, tell him War Eagle, tell him I sent you. Ford Stokes, retirement results from Active Wealth. Well, it's Thursday. The, the time has come. Auburn, Hugh Freeze, Peyton Thorne, uh, Keldrick Falk, Eugene Asante will take the stage and field the questions from the the crowd uh, of reporters, trying to get, get all kinds of little bitty tidbits, little bits of information as we get ready to kick this season off. I unfortunately will not be there. Who, who knows? Uh, maybe maybe in the future uh, that would be something that I can do uh, as well. It will be a lot of fun. But if I was there, I would have some very – uh, poignant questions, very, very targeted questions for each one. And I hope something similar is asked of them uh, this week. I want to go one by one, just talk about the questions that I would love to hear answered uh, from Hugh Freeze, from Peyton Thorne, from Keldrick Falk, and from uh, Eugene Asante. But let's start with the big man. Let's start with the head guy, Hugh Freeze. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Hugh Freeze. I'd love to ask Hugh uh, – you know, do you second guess yourself at all uh, for the the decision you made last year to step off the field from a play calling standpoint and, and focus solely on kick starting this Auburn recruiting uh, machine, kick starting this Auburn uh, recruiting uh, mechanism to build back these relationships, build back these high school relationships, get after these high school coaches, get in these high schools that, that Auburn's been absent from uh, over the last several years. Uh, was it worth it? Did you Do you feel like – I know you feel like you had to feel like you left a little bit of meat on the bone uh, as far as last season's record, the offensive output, uh, things of that nature. Uh, I, I know you probably feel like you left some out there, you know. So do, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Do you feel like the foundation has been built? Uh, do you feel confident that the foundation has been built that – even I, 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 you probably had uh, expectations of doing that for longer than just one season, but I think it, maybe it went so poorly you felt like you had to jump in and go ahead ahead of schedule uh, and, and take the reins over. You know, was it worth it? I'd love to hear Hugh break that down. Uh, I, I got an idea of what he would say. I feel like he would think, say, you no, know, totally, it was worth it. Look at the results of last year's class uh, coming off of a, a coaching transition. Not a lot of success on the field from an at least from an offensive perspective. Uh, and look where you end up in recruiting. You end up with a top 10 class. Uh, you get several key positions filled uh, with extremely high end players. And then a the big thing, uh, you know, and again, I'm I guess I'm a- asking and answering. I'm predicting what the answer would be. 
But uh, I'd love, I still love to hear it from Hugh Freeze. But I mean, look at the the, the start to this twenty twenty six class again. It makes it the work you put in last year, uh, as far as building those relationships, especially at the high school level, has is really going to pay off for the twenty twenty six class. And then if you can put the product on the field in twenty twenty six, it's going to keep kind of snowballing and, and pushing it out there. So. I personally think he would. I obviously think he would say it was it was worth it. But I'd love to hear him. Ta- I love to hear him talk about that. I'd love to hear him say, I, you know, really fill us in on on, on how he feels about that decision uh, that they made last year, and, and then how he the the decision to go ahead and take the reins this year. You know, why'd you do it so quickly? Uh, I, I I wonder a lot of the time. I wonder a lot of times if. If it was mainly the uh, the hang up not being able to get Derek Nix last year, uh, there were there were times I think that was where he kind of wanted to go to begin with, uh, and there were some hang ups with the contract and things of things like that with with Ole Miss, uh, and then this was just sort of like the next next thing he had to had to do was was kind of kick it over to Philip Montgomery and, and and turn the reins over, and then he drove the he drove the uh, the you know he led the charge as far as the recruiting goes. Uh, a lot of stuff around. I'd love to hear someone. I hope someone goes kind of kind of dives into that and, and gets a good gets a good answer for him uh, there. That's that's the direction that I will go. And Hugh Freeze is honest to a fault, and I think he'd give us a pretty cool answer. I, I'd love to. I'd love to hear his. I'd love to hear his answer on that. Switching gears, moving to Peyton Thorne. I think it's easy. I think this one's easy. You know, <clears throat> last year the production was just not good enough. OK, it's not SEC level, 1700 yards passing uh, in a vacuum. If you just look at the box score, not going to get it. Now, I know there was a lot of factors in that. There was the the rotating quarterbacks at times. There was the the play calling uh, aspect of it, the, the relationship between him and the offensive coordinator. And then there was the I mean, quite frankly, just the, the talent level uh, at receiver that made it tough to execute, uh, at, you know, especially in crunch time. You know, think about that last, you know, the Georgia the Georgia game. You know, that last drive, Georgia scores to take the lead. All you got to do is get a field goal, I think, to maybe tie or or, or something like that. You don't even have to go that far. And, and, and he makes what I think was some pretty decent throws, puts them, puts them where they need to be. Uh, and you just can't, at least especially on that last drive, you just can't – you don't have the guys there to be able to make those plays right now. And, you know what? Sell us on why. Sell us on why we should expect anything different. Spe- sell us on why uh, we should expect a meteoric jump. For Auburn to be successful, you have to increase your output exponentially. Uh, not quite double, but close to it. I mean, you need to throw for at least a thousand more yards. Yeah, you know, you, seventeen hundred yards isn't going to get it. Twenty seven hundred yards would be, you know. I think Auburn's going to be a pretty good football team if Peyton Thorne can get to that. That's that's a big jump, you know. You know that is that is a huge jump, you know, from from a touchdown perspective. Uh, not a ton of touchdowns. I think somewhere around sixteen. That probably needs to be plus twenty. You know, up in the twenties to be able to uh, for Auburn to be where they want to be as far as offensive football goes. Uh, those jumps. It, it, those are big. Those are huge, huge jumps, and, and I don't feel like it happens a ton. Uh, you know, you typically you'll see maybe a three, four hundred yard increase here or there, uh, but uh, a thou over a thousand yards for Auburn to be successful, where I think Hugh Freeze wants to be, that's a tall task. Why should we expect that? You know, why? What do we have to point to to say that that's even remotely possible? Uh, I think that's a tough question. Uh, but I think Peyton can answer it. I think Peyton has a he's he's said a lot. Uh, uh, he said a lot at times this offseason that's a lot more detailed than than you would expect from the you know the 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 game planning aspect of last year, the relationship aspect of last year, uh, the the rotating quarterbacks and how that killed momentum at times uh, last year, right or wrong, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I think Peyton would have. Um, some really good ass, uh, answers. Kind of a sidebar. There is some precedent for this. There is some precedence for a uh, for a big jump, uh, and there's precedent for a big jump at Auburn. 
Uh, you don't really have to look much further uh, than – you don't have to go really much further than Chris Todd. Uh, you look at Chris Todd, who threw for, uh, threw for 900 yards uh, in 2008, five touchdowns and six interceptions. Uh, and then there's a coaching change, there's an offensive change, and a new offensive coordinator, and he throws for 2,600 yards. Uh, so a, a plus of about of over 1,700 yards in one year. Uh, goes from five touchdowns to 22 touchdowns. At that time, that was the single-season record for touchdowns uh, in a year, I believe. So there is precedence, and there's precedence at Auburn for guys uh, – to make big jumps. I think Jason Campbell is another one you could possibly look at to, to, uh, to show a big jump from, from year to year. Uh, not well, not quite as big, but you know, from 2002 to, to 2003, you know, 2003 wasn't the big year you wanted to, but you went up a thousand yards there and then you went up over 500 yards, uh, 500 yards in and doubled your touchdowns from 2003 to 2004, not quite as big of a jump. And we'd need a little bit bigger jump than even, that for for Thorne, but there is precedence at Auburn for big quarterback jumps from from one year uh, to the other. So I think that's something that you can kind of point to. Obviously, this is a completely different scenario, but I think it may be, I think it may be a better scenario. I think it may be a better scenario for a big jump because Hugh Freeze rarely has ever had quarterbacks not throw for close to 3,000 yards uh, and a pile of touchdowns or or put, or, or 3,000-plus uh, total yards from scrimmage. When you talk about Malik uh, Willis, who didn't ever throw for over 3,000, but he also would always add in, you know, close to 1,000 yards rushing. So, uh, again, I think that's a tough question. I think that would be something I'd be interested to hear him sell himself and sell the system, sell sell the the, the chemistry, sell the receiver room, sell – all the reasons why Auburn fans should expect a big jump, a massive jump. Uh, I'm just being completely honest. It's it's a exponential jump he would have to make uh, from a production standpoint from last year to this year for Auburn to be a competitive offensive football team. It, you, it, there's no <laughs> there's no way around it. Uh, you, you can't do what you did last year and expect uh, in, expect better results, and that's where Auburn's got to go this year. You got to be, you got to keep climbing, you got to keep pushing. So, I'd be interested to hear. Uh, I hope something along those lines is asked, and I'd love to hear his uh, answer for that. Keldrick Falk, look, man, uh, true sophomore didn't start most of the year last year. There was only towards the end of last year where he really took over uh, as a starter didn't have just incredible production, good production, but not just mind-blowing production. But all of a sudden, true sophomore, you're a leader. You're leading this team. You're the voice of this defensive line room. You're the one of the th top three voices of the team going to uh, SEC media days. With five-plus defensive linemen that are, A, either older than you, or B, been at Auburn longer than you. Uh, how do you handle? How do you how do you keep that chemistry? How, how does that how does that work? Uh, to be, you know, sort of to just have that meteoric jump over these guys. You can't say, oh, well, a lot of those guys were transfers. I mean, gosh, we took a transfer, Elijah McAllister. We took him to SEC Media Days last year. He had barely been on campus. Uh, <laughs> for just a few months, uh, and and he he's leading the charge for, for SEC media days. Uh, I think I think that in general shows uh, that Hugh Freeze doesn't play favorites. Hugh Freeze doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't discriminate. If you're a leader, if you're on one of the good lists, he talks about – Hugh Freeze talks about lists, I'll put you up there. I'll put you up there. I'll lean on you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what class you're in. Uh, and it doesn't matter who's in front of you. Uh, if you're the if you're the guy, you're going to be the guy. I'd love to hear I'd love to hear Keldrick talk about uh, you know how you balance relationships. You know the defensive line. It's not just Keldrick Falk. It's not just like he's the quarterback and, and there's no other quarterback out there. There there's a there's a quite frankly there, there's more there's three or four more guys that are going to be next to him and all every one of those are going to be older than him. Every one of those are probably going to have a little bit of chip on their shoulder. So how do you balance that? 
even as a young guy, how do you keep uh, – how, how do you – I mean, just – I don't know. How do you balance that? How do you keep uh, how do you keep the relationship there? How do you keep everybody uh, on board uh, and and not just sort of thinking uh, they deserve they deserve it over you? Like, what do you do? What do you do to sell that to them? I'd love to hear his answer on that, because Hugh Freeze clearly sees something uh, in this kid that it's worth taking him uh, over. He, he he trusts that he can take this kid and this kid can still handle that room and keep it, uh, keep everybody together. I think that's that's impressive in and of itself. I'd love to hear his answer uh, on how he would balance uh, the older guys uh, and, and the the personalities there and, and keep keep that room together and keep uh, keep growing as a defensive line uh, group. Because uh, again, something like that could shake could shake the foundation of the room. Uh, and Hugh Freeze has enough faith in this guy to go ahead uh, and take him to SEC Media Day. So I'd love to hear his thoughts uh, on that. Last but not least, my man, Eugene Asante. Starting off, I got to ask him, is it true that I inspired your top button? It, I just got to go ahead. I just got to hand. Is it true that, that the top button, uh, the top button getting buttoned, uh, you being a top button guy, did it? Where did it come from? And why was it Charlie Five? Uh, and locked on Auburn. No, uh, that was obviously a joke from last year. He did a, a press conference, uh, I think, either before, after practice or after a game, uh, and he had the button buttoned all the way to the top. So, obviously, everybody was tagging me on Twitter and things like that. But, that, no, that would be funny. But I think the big question I would ask, ask him, and this is because Auburn did a, such a terrible job of protecting their coaches uh, in, in the spring, uh, and the, especially DJ Durkin, uh, and let him be sort of ambushed by a completely, completely out of bounds question from an AL.com uh, reporter. But what's it like to, what's it really like? Tell us the reality. What's it really like to play for DJ Durkin? Uh, I would love to know, you know, everything about him from, from the intensity from what he demands on the practice field to the relationships that he has. He's obviously a phenomenal recruiter. You're, you're recruiting really well on the defensive side uh, of the ball already this year, uh, and, and you feel pretty good about the def defense in general upcoming. His intensity and during A-Day was, was infectious. The dude was trying to win. He's blitzing from <laughs> – from everywhere, sending Jalen McLeod on every single play, trying to get to the quarterback to the point where it was, quite frankly, it was pissing off Hugh Freeze. Okay, we've seen what Jalen McLeod can do, get him off the field. <laughs> you know, trying to win. What's it like playing for that guy? Uh, you you don't really have to look much further. Um, you don't really have to look much further than the newest uh, the newest addition from Maryland, uh, the, the linebacker that we just signed, uh, to understand that, Hey, maybe maybe some of these narratives are not quite as as legit as we would like to think, or maybe the narratives aren't quite as legit as they're being portrayed. Um, I can't I can't pronounce his name. I should be practicing, but uh, the kid from Maryland, he was recruited by DJ Durkin. Uh, it was a very quick stint that he was there, but there the relationship was obviously there uh, to transfer and play for him. Uh, even through the tragedy that ha even he lived through that tragedy uh, that that happened, uh, it, you know, to still want to come play for him, and not only that, but to use him as possibly a tutor to get into coaching, you know, that to me actions speak louder than a lot of words, uh, and I and, and, and to to the, all the hit pieces and things like that that came out, I've gotten banned, I've gotten blocked on Twitter from a few guys that I've shoved it back in their face. Uh, cause I don't, I don't play that. I don't like to play that game. I, I like honesty. I like honesty. I don't like narratives. Uh, and I'd love to hear Asante kind of squash some of these narratives. Cause I think obviously it, for him to be picked, uh, I, I'm assuming DJ Durkin had a lot to, to say about that. And, uh, I would imagine their relationship would have to be at a level where, you know, Durkin would feel comfortable nominating him to go. I think it would just, it just has to, I think that's just reality. So I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear his answer on that. I'd love to hear, you know, A, what's the, how, how do you feel about the scheme? You know, how, how do you fit in the scheme? B, how do you feel about Durkin just as a coach in general from all aspects, relationships, intensity? Do you feel safe? I mean, I don't mind. Do you feel safe 
uh, playing for a guy like DJ Durkin uh, because that, that's been the narrative uh, ever since uh, you know he left Maryland. Well, re not really. Only until he's only until he came to Auburn that became a big part of the narrative. But regardless, I'd love to hear his answer on that. And then if you want to throw in a top button question for him too today, I don't mind. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be mad at you if you if, if anybody wants to throw that out there. So, uh, it's a big day. Look, there's no there's no shine away from it. There's just not a ton of football news out there. So you got to get excited about the little opportunities that you get to to hear from the team, hear from the coaches. Fall camp still probably, you know, three to four weeks away. Maybe a little bit shorter, but but uh, I think it maybe start at the beginning of August. Maybe it's not quite that far away. Maybe it's, I, I'm sort of losing my calendar here. It may only be a couple, like two or three weeks away. Uh, but up, until then, uh, these are the kind of things that you get excited about. These are the, the little glimpses you get of the team, a little bit of glimpses you get of the coaches, and uh, uh, hopefully we can get some good good answers and some good information from today. And we'll, we'll definitely break it down. Uh, on tomorrow's show uh, and go over everything that was said, was asked, uh, and, and all the information that we get from it. So, guys, if you like this video, like it. If you like this channel, subscribe to it. Hit that bell so you're notified whenever news goes live. Uh, we're going to do a lot more, as, especially as the season goes on, uh, of maybe some spontaneous live stuff. We'll see what happens. But, yeah, you want to be make sure you're on – uh, you're on alert. So hit that bell. Follow me on Twitter, the underscore Charlie underscore five. Uh, and we're going to be back here every single day again. Hope you all enjoy the the SEC media days. Hope you all enjoyed uh, all the, the content that, it, that was put out from everybody uh, over the week. Uh, and I'm literally looking forward to seeing what the boys have to say today. So, guys, y'all have a great rest of your Thursday. And we're going to get after it back again tomorrow. Uh, on our Friday edition, wrap the week up, put a bow on it. Uh, this is another episode of the Top Button Podcast. Stay buttoned. Thanks for listening and drive home safely.